My name is Tim Falk. I'm the customer service manager here at Mr. Beer. If you've ever called us or emailed us, we've probably talked. Today, we are going to be brewing our Churchill's Nut Brown Ale. It's a very popular beer. In my not all that humble opinion, this beer is probably one of our best refills that turns out great when you brew it just with the can extract by itself. It has a 4.1 star review on our website. I think that's underrating it a little bit. There might have been some brewers in there who had a, some kind of problem with their brew because I have had outstanding results with this beer. It is a 5.5% ABV beer. ABV again stands for alcohol by volume. Um, it has an SRM of 22. SRM stands for standard reference method. It's a scale of 1 to 40. So this beer is kind of in the middle being a brown ale. It's a system that modern brewers use to specify color, SRM is. It has 20 IBUs. IBUs, of course, being international bitterness units. They tell you how bitter your beer is. That's on a scale of 1 to 100. So 20 is on the low end. This is definitely a malty style. Um, the refill is going to contain this can of hopped malt extract um, with the yeast under the lid. The yeast for this beer is actually um, different than what comes with most of our other um, refills. The uh, Most of our other refills come with our standard Mr. Beer yeast, which is kind of an all-purpose ale yeast. This one, on the other hand, comes with an English ale yeast. If you see here, it uh, says Churchill on the um, on the packet, so that's how you know that's one you got. It's comparable to uh, Saf Ale SO4 if you were going to compare it to something else. Um, and as always, you also get the packet of No Rinse Cleanser. So as always, we are going to go ahead and get started by putting our can of extract without the yeast into some hot water. That's because the stuff in that can has a real thick consistency. It's kind of like molasses. So we put it in hot water to kind of loosen it up a bit. Also to be able to peel off the label a little bit easier. But you're going to want to make sure you grab your yeast before you submerge your can in water because heat kills yeast. Cold makes it go to sleep. It's an easy enough thing to remember. So you don't want to expose your yeast to any undue heat. So now that our extract is loosening up a little bit, we're going to go ahead and sanitize our equipment, which first means um, assembling our fermenter. The reason we sanitize our equipment is because beer is a very attractive environment for bacteria, mold, and wild yeasts. Now, none of those are the kind that are going to make anybody sick. Nothing in brewing is going to make you sick, fortunately. But uh, these infections, as they're called, can lead to off flavors. Um, sometimes it can be kind of a blessing in disguise and complement the style, but uh, more often than not, it's going to be a flavor that's undesirable for the style. So it's better to stay sanitized with everything that touches the beer. Now when I put the spigot on, I'm going to take the nut and uh, put the spigot through the opening right there. And uh, I'm going to kind of put the spigot at an angle right there. And that's because it's kind of hard to get a good uh, grasp on the, the nut part. So I uh, turn it by the spigot part since it's easier to get a good grasp on it. And there we go. We're going to fill this up with a gallon of, a gallon of water to the number one line. At the same time, you're getting your uh, sanitizing solution ready. You're also kind of looking at your spigot to check for leaks to make sure, you know, all your equipment is functioning properly and that you assembled it all right. You don't want to find out you have a leak um, when you already have your beer brewing, obviously. That's about a gallon. And should you ever have equipment that leaks, please feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. We'll be happy to get you squared away, figure out what's wrong with it, and replace anything that needs replacing if need be. 
Um, so right now I'm putting half this packet of no rinse cleanser into my fermenter. We're going to save the other half for bottling day. I think we should try and work in another bottling day soon. We've been doing a lot of brewing. I'm just going to mix in my sanitizer a little bit. And then I'm going to put the lid of my fermenter on. And I'm going to shake it around. Make sure that the solution touches everything that could touch the beer. You'll notice if you turn the fermenter upside down, it's going to leak a little bit. Uh, the fermenter is not intended to be airtight. Uh, fermentation produces a little bit of carbon dioxide um, and that needs to be released as fermentation goes on. I'm just uh, filling up a little bowl with more sanitizing solutions so uh, we can sanitize the rest of our equipment. You're going to need a can opener. You're going to need a funnel. I guess you don't really need a funnel, but uh, the whole thing goes a lot easier if you have one. You're going to need a large spoon. I use a flat one because it makes it easier to scrape the can. And you're going to need a bowl like the one I'm filling up right now because it makes it a little easier to sanitize this equipment. Um, so the bummer is that infections can happen even if you sanitize everything properly. They happen even to experienced brewers. Uh, our very own Josh, with his 20 years of brewing experience, gets infected batches sometimes. I've only been doing this for three years or so, but I just had a batch of infected cider last week. So even if you know what you're doing, and you do everything as you ought to, sometimes things don't quite go according to your plan. So don't get too frustrated if you develop an infected batch even though you sanitized everything right. It doesn't mean you suck at brewing, it just means you got unlucky this time and you need to call us to get a replacement so we can get you set up to try again. All right, so we're gonna, now that everything is sanitized, we're gonna pour four cups of filtered water into our pot here. We recommend three quarts or larger, but I like to use kind of a big one because when you stir, it doesn't splash as much. When I use that little silver pot, I have all kinds of problems. And we're going to bring it to a boil. the stuff in those silver foil packs or you have uh, booster the stuff in the white bags or you have DME dry malt extract you can boil all that stuff if you want to but you can't boil this the reason is it's already had a hot boil done to the extract meaning that further boiling is going to lead to grassy off flavors um, you'll occasionally hear people with concerns about sanitation, but the thing of it is, um, <coughs> the canning process kills anything in your extract that might have caused infections. Obviously, anyone who knows anything about canning or drying can tell you, you want to make sure that anything that you're doing like that needs to be sanitized already. So it's just not really a concern when you're working with canned products like that. And at any rate, the water is just recently boiled, so that kind of flash exposure, you know, in my experience, should take care of anything that might come up. Man, this burner is so fast, I like it. Garace 1010 is doing the Irish stout when he gets home. That's a good one. That's definitely, I think that's my favorite of our, um, of our standard series of refills, that or the Bavarian Vice Beer. Um, but I think the stout's better than the porter, in my own, again, not that humble opinion. Um, we're just waiting for our water to boil. We've got our can out. Oh yeah, that's good. So, let's go ahead and turn off our heat source. It's very quick. 
And then we open our can of extracts with our can opener. Sometimes it'll overflow a little like that if the water you put it in is especially hot. It's not a huge deal. It just can make kind of a mess, so be a little careful. If you do ever spill any extract, you're going to want to clean it up as soon as possible because believe me, if you miss some and then you try and come back for it, it's just going to be a huge pain in the neck. Just try and clean. The stuff turns into like rubber cement darn near. So we're pouring in our extract. We're going to scrape the can as much as possible because the more extracts we leave behind, the more flavor, color, aroma, and ABV we are going to lose. You might find that if you leave too much extract in the can, you have a low starting gravity. Starting gravity, of course, refers to um, the specific gravity, which kind of tells you how much stuff is floating around in a liquid. In this case, the liquid is water and the stuff is sugar. It tells you how much sugar is in your beer. You use a hydrometer or a refractometer to measure that. We're not going to do that today. Um, so the long and the short of it is the less sugar that ends up in your beer, the less alcohol it's going to have. I expect we'll probably do a show on gravity and hydrometers and refractometers and all that one of these days. Today is not that day though. Alright. So that should do it. I'm just going to give it kind of a quick stir to make sure that not too much settles to the bottom because that stuff is sticky. You don't want to leave too much laying around. Josh Correct is always pointing out that you can age beer um, for most styles just about as long as your bottles can withstand it because beer like wine tends to improve as it ages. As a matter of fact, some beers also like wine taste a little bit harsh as soon as fermentation is done and need a little bit of time to mellow out before they get very drinkable. So conditioning refers to the process of letting your beer age in the bottles. Um, now when I said the kind of bottle you use matters, I meant stirring it again so it doesn't stick. That uh, our standard plastic bottles that come with our kits will get you about uh, one year before the beer starts getting exposed to oxygen. Um, our oxygen barrier bottles will get you about three years. And glass bottles should pretty much be indefinite in theory as long as they're sealed right. Now we're filling up our keg to the number one mark with um, cold filtered water. The water is cold because the work needs to be at about 65 degrees Fahrenheit before we pitch our yeast. Work refers to the unfermented mix of uh, malted barley and hops. That's this stuff in the can and the water that the yeast is going to ferment and turn into beer. Right now it's worked. In three weeks it'll be beer. And pitching your yeast just refers to adding it to the, um, adding the yeast to the worts. Now we're adding our hot extract mix to our fermenter with a gallon of cold water. Um, as far as water, a lot of new and intermediate brewers tend to forget that beer is mostly water. So the quality of the water you use is very, very important. Uh, the rule of thumb here is that if water tastes good to drink, it should generally produce beer that tastes good. Uh, that's the idea anyhow. There are a couple exceptions. Uh, you'd want to steer clear of distilled water. Right now I'm filling up the fermenter to the number two line with filtered water. You'd want to clear, steer clear of distilled water because it lacks any minerals whatsoever. Same goes for reverse osmosis water. Um, yeast is a living thing, just like us, and just like us, it needs minerals to survive. Um, now the canned extracts 
sure to have some minerals in there to keep the yeast at least alive, but why take a chance? Um, a little bit more is always better here. Right now I'm taking out my funnel, and then I'm going to go ahead and aerate my wort. Um, yeah. If we were doing this the old-fashioned way from scratch, all grain brewing with uh, actual grains and actual hops, this would have taken several hours. Uh, you can watch Josh's advanced show on Wednesdays to uh, get a better idea of that. Um, also, like us, beer needs ox, or rather yeast need oxygen to get by. After this point, you want to expose your beer to oxygen as little as possible. Right now, though, it's okay to go ahead and whisk it, aerate it, to get a little bit going in there. So now, I forget to get my scissors out. I'm going to go ahead and pitch the yeast. Um, like I was saying, if we were doing this the old-fashioned way, it would take a very long time. We would need to wait for the work to cool. We would need to do our mash and our hot boil. So this way is much, much faster and requires much less space and much less equipment. Where did my lid go? There it is. Now we just screw on our lid. Once that lid is on, you should take it off as little as possible. It's okay to take it off if you really need to, like if you need to add an ingredient like say a tincture of zest that you've been preparing or a tincture of cacao nibs or uh, you know dry hopping of late fruit addition. It's okay to take the lid off for just a second, make your addition and then put your lid back on. But you don't want to be taking your lid off every day for a couple minutes to look at the fermentation and see how cool it looks and see how gross it looks and see if it's done yet and if it's done yet and if it's done yet. If you're going to be brewing beer, you're going to need to be patient. Um, so if you really want to see what your beer is doing, you can shine a flashlight through the fermenter and kind of see a little bit. You'll be able to see some sediment collecting on the bottom of your fermenter. That stuff is called true. It's made of spent yeast particles and uh, malt. Um, that stuff is a sign that fermentation is happening. So if you don't see sediment gathering at the bottom of your fermenter, it means your beer is not fermenting. If you don't see foam, that's not as big of a deal. Some beers and yeasts are going to make whole lots of visible foam. Some aren't going to make very much at all. Uh, you don't really need to worry too much about that. Um, after about 24 hours, you'll start seeing that um, activity in your fermenter. Um, you're going to want to ferment this beer at 68 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. You're going to want to keep in mind that that temperature is referring to what we want the temperature of the beer to be, not the temperature of the air in the room your fermenter's in, ideally. Um, fermentation produces a little bit of heat, so your beer is usually going to be a couple degrees warmer than the room you leave it in. Um, with this in mind, if the air in the room is in like the low 70s, let's say, I would suggest taking that fermenter and putting it in a picnic cooler with a couple of uh, frozen water bottles or ice packs or something like that, and that should help uh, control the temperature. Um, when would you add a cup of honey or brown sugar? Gord Weave wants to know. That's a good question. Um, you would have added a cup of honey or brown sugar at the same time as you added in the can of extract to the hot water right after you boiled it. Um, now, if you want to add an ingredient like that, you should do it in the primary fermenter. That's this fermenter. If you're only using one fermenter, then that's just a primary. Um, sometimes, actually, Quite often we will get people calling or writing in and asking if they can use stuff like honey or brown sugar as priming sugar. The answer is technically yes, but the amount that you're putting into the bottles is so small that it's not really going to make any difference as far as flavor. You're also going to have a harder time dialing in the amount of carbonation you're going to get because different honeys can have different amounts of sugar. Um, so with that in mind, if you're looking to add honey or brown sugar flavor to your beer, do it in the primary fermenter, not at the bottling stage. If you're looking for priming sugar, just use our carbonation drops or our regular old table sugar, which is the cheapest option. Um, so today, 
we're going to talk about beer semantics a little bit. Specifically, we're going to talk about what makes a craft beer craft and what makes a microbrewery a microbrewery. So in the mid-2000s, those who wanted to distinguish their beer taste from that of the masses requested microbrews made by microbreweries when they were in search of a tastier beer. Microbreweries represented an alternative attitude towards beer. They didn't apply the aggressive marketing strategies that the macro breweries did. So you wouldn't see a lot of ads for uh, your micro brews. They would have to get around by word of mouth and uh, in your local beer scene. And uh, these micro breweries seem to stand for quality and diversity that their opponents did not. However, the term microbrewery only refers to the amount, or rather to the size of the beer, the brewery itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Microbreweries are those that produce no more than 15,000 barrels of beer per year, which is not all that much. So the term microbrewery, and uh, as we'll come to see in a moment, nanobrewery, does not tell you anything whatsoever about the kind of beer or the way it's made or their business practices, just that they make less than 15,000 barrels of beer per year. Um, there's kind of an assumption, I think, that smaller batches means higher quality. Um, I don't think it's the batch size that really does it. I think it's the techniques and the ingredients. We'll get to that here in a minute. Um, as the drive for smaller local breweries and rotating small batches grew, microbrew and microbrewery fell out of popular use for the reasons we just went over. They're not a great idea of the kind of beer you're going to be getting, just how much of it the company makes. They were simply not descriptive enough for patrons who bellied up to the bar looking for a quality beer. However, the emergence of these terms into popular use meant that the emergence of an us versus them attitude in the beer industry, which is still very much present. You will see all the time if you go on the internet, go on Reddit, you know, the beer sub, or you go to any beer or home brewing board, there is a lot of snobbery and a lot of kind of what I think of as hipsterism where, you know, there's a lot of people trying to brag about how they know the smallest, most obscure beer style and brewery. Um, at any rate, craft beer emerged shortly thereafter as a more useful descriptor for quality beer. By the standards of the Brewers Association, craft beer means small, independent, and traditional beer. Now, what do those terms mean, small, independent, and traditional? For the purposes of the Brewers Association, Small means an annual production of 6 million barrels of beer or less, approximately 3% of U.S. annual sales. If you remember, a microbrewery only brews about, um, or rather not about, it brews 15,000 or less. So by the Brewers Association's definition, uh, craft can be much, much larger than what constitutes a microbrewery. Uh, beer production in a small brewery is attributed to a brewer according to the rules of alternating proprietorships. Um, so, uh, independent. Independent means less than 25% of the craft brewery is owned or controlled by a beverage alcohol industry member which is not itself a craft brewer. What that means is that if a company can, like uh, let's say AB InVev, um, a major brewery <clears throat> that makes something like Budweiser, Coors, um, if one of those companies owns more than 25% stake in your company, you can't be considered craft beer by the Brewers Association definitions. And the last uh, aspect of craft breweries is traditionalism. A brewery that has a majority of its total beverage alcohol volume and beers whose flavors derive from traditional or innovative brewing ingredients and their fermentation. So what that kind of means in plain English is that to constitute craft brewery, you have to brew beers that are of a either traditional or innovative style. So that means that if all you make is a single American adjunct lager with a couple different variations, that is not craft beer. You have to make stuff like IPAs, pale ales, saisons, stouts, BJCP recognized styles, and a wide variety of them of the traditional and more innovative variety. We do have a new blog post about all this stuff, so you don't have to memorize every word I'm saying. I know you will anyway because you're enthralled, but uh, regardless, uh, it's just posted up on our website now. Matt just went ahead and put it in our chat stream. 
flavored malt beverages are not considered beers, as I'm sure all of you already knew. When large conglomerates started buying up breweries that had previously fit the craft beer definition, it became clear that terms needed to adapt once again. So in the summer of 2017, the Brewers Association launched the new seal for independent craft breweries, which was their opportunity to underscore the independent part of their craft beer definition, which continues to be under attack by buyouts. This is a very, very contentious topic within the brewing community. Um, there are a lot of beer fans and brewers, home brewers and otherwise, who will not touch um, a major corporation's beer, much less shop at a store that sells one. Um, and you know, if that's what you want to do, that's just fine. I'm not going to comment much further on that. I'll just, you know, like I said, it's a contentious topic. Uh, the seal with an upside down beer bottle at its center is meant to symbolize how craft beers turn the beer market on its head. In a more practical sense, the seal is meant to mark beers made by a small and independent brewer. To see this information again, you can visit our blog called Microbrew vs. Craft vs. Independent Craft on MrBeer.com slash blog. Alright guys, so that about covers our uh, semantics talk. I'm going to go ahead and give it a second uh, to, for you guys to go ahead and let me know any questions you might have before we wrap it up today. Um, like I said, we brewed an English brown ale, which is a bit on the malty side. Ours is at any rate. It's kind of in the middle between light and dark as beers go. Um, so you won't get a lot of roasted notes from it. I would say you get more like toffee or caramel kind of notes from it. Um, but you don't quite get the roasty coffee notes you get with a porter or stout. Um, really, you don't guys have any, you guys don't have any questions today? You're being so shy. How many people are watching anyway? Well, okay. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions, then thank you so much for watching. And you can tune in tomorrow when Josh does our advanced brewing stream. I'm glad I read that and reminded myself to tell you guys that we are going to be moving from three days a week to two days a week. So I will continue doing Tuesday. I will cover beginner and intermediate beers. And then on Wednesday, Josh will be doing the advanced stream still. Okay, so Tuesday and Wednesday, still two days a week. Still not a bad deal. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And I will see you next week.